Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our fifth, fifth webinar of the series titled Combating Corruption, Safeguarding Sales and Marketing. This webinar is held as part of the Pearl Initiative Anti-Corruption Best Practices Programme. And for this series of webinar, we are holding it in collaboration with the Good Corporation. To give you a brief introduction to the Pearl Initiative for those of you that aren't familiar with us, um, we are the region's leading non-profit business-led organisation founded to promote a corporate culture of accountability and transparency as a key driver of business competitiveness across the private sector. We usually hold knowledge sharing events in person, seminars, workshops and roundtables, etc. But due to the circumstances, we are unable to hold them in real life. So we're here virtually for the time being, although we hope to resume in-person events as soon as we can. And that being said, um, we have got quite an active um, agenda for our webinars across a breadth of programs and topics and you can find out more about them on our website and you can also watch on-demand viewing for previous webinars on our Pearl Initiative um, YouTube channels. Um, please do pay use those at your convenience. About today's webinar, when it comes to the bottom line, few business functions are more important than sales and marketing. However, from the perspective of anti-corruption experts, sales and marketing activities can present a significant risk with prosecuting authorities routinely holding companies to account for the corrupt practices of their sales and marketing agents, it is becoming clear that risks cannot be outsourced. With data showing worrying trends in the adequacy of basic sales and marketing controls, companies are now more routinely requiring their sales agents to follow the anti-bribery and corruption procedures. This webinar will devote much needed focus to the sales and marketing functions, its research for best practices and countering corruption. It will examine data from over 100 anti-bribery and, corp and corruption assessments in which more than 7,000 business practices have been put to the test. Leveraging the expertise and knowledge from our guest speakers here with us today, we do aim to discuss, discuss how companies can stay active in the areas of sales and marketing without jeopardizing their compliance with anti-bribery and corruption laws and best practice standards. We'll also shed light on a few examples of where sales and marketing controls most often fail and some examples of companies exhibiting best practice in their sales and marketing controls. To that end, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, joining us from the UAE is Mohammed Daoud, a strategic leader and the seasonal career professional with over 25 years experience in the banking and finance sector in the US, Europe, Middle East and Africa, focusing on governance, risk and compliance for over 18 years. Mohammed's extensive experience focuses on various domains of risk strategy with effective corporate governance and reputational risk. He broadened his international leadership experience across both business and technology management, including strategy consulting, business transformation, operations and products. With his expertise in fintech and regtech solutions, Hamid connects data intelligence and helps in identifying, assessing and monitoring regulatory and third party risks. Based on his experience, Mohammed has substantial knowledge in anti-money laundering, combating the finance of terrorism and is effective in deploying anti-bribery and corruption programs. Thank you, Mohammed, for joining us today. You're um, welcome. Joining us from London, um, many of you will recognize Mo Michael as a um, familiar face now for the series of webinars. Um, Michael's Senior Business Ethics Consultant at Good Corporation. A regular speaker and trainer on business ethics and issues of ethical company culture, Michael has conducted business ethics and tra training sessions and webinars across the MENA region, including, most recently, a day-long workshop on business ethics and compliance with clients and potential clients of the European Banking Priro. His experience in the MENA region also includes work in Algeria and Saudi Arabia. Before joining Good Corporation, Michael worked as the lead researcher and advisor on business ethics to the chair of the Modern Slavery Bill Evidence Review at the UK Parliament. While in Parliament, Michael worked with a number of high-profile UK politicians, government ministers and government suppliers focusing on business ethics in general and human rights in, in particular. Thanks again, Michael, for leading this session for us. No pleasure. Um, we do like to make our webinars as inter interactive as possible, so we do encourage you to ask as many questions as you can using the Q&A function on the right-hand side of your screen, um, and they will be filtered through to Michael, who will um, then pass the questions through to Mohammed, um, and they will try to answer them at the end of the session. I have to note, that on this topic in particular, we found it extremely difficult to find someone that was qualified and experienced enough to um, participate in the conversation and that was willing to participate in this conversation. So um, I do expect a very exciting um, discussion here and um, really do encourage you to ask questions to leverage the expertise of our panelists today. So I'll hand over to Michael now 
he's going to go through a 10 minute presentation highlighting the work of the Google Corporation and he'll in, then he'll initiate a deep dive with Mohammed. Over to you gentlemen, thanks once again. Thank you, yes, that's the fantastic introduction as always and I'm very, very happy to be back here as always. As Yasmin says, this session should not just be about me and Hamid talking to you, it should be about you guys talking to us. We've almost got a competition going at the moment for the most controversial questions. We like controversial questions in these sessions because it makes me think, it makes Mohammed think and it means we can get some really interesting discussion going. I think based on uh, Yasmin's introduction there, it's clear that this is quite a controversial area because sales and marketing is such an important part of business for pretty much every company I can think of, but they also bring with them significant anti-bribery and corruption risks. So we're going to be focusing on those risks today and talking about how we can have active, vibrant sales and marketing functions which steer clear of the kind of bribery and corruption risks which go with them. I'm just going to talk a little bit at first here about uh, what we do and the kind of data that we have on this. Um, so first of all, about good corporation, in terms of what gives us the ability to talk about this, well, we've been in the ethics and compliance game for a long time. We've got 20 years of experience now um, in terms of assessing and building and embedding ethics and compliance programs. We've done that well over 600 times in more than 85 countries now. And because we do so many assessments, we have a lot of data. And we use this data to give participants in this webinar and our other clients key information that they need about what's difficult, what's easy, why are people getting this right, why are people getting this wrong. In the area of anti-bribery and corruption specifically, we've done well over 100 specific assessments in that area. And we're going to be leveraging some of that data in this session today. Now, first of all, we like to begin with some definitions, so we all know that we're, what we're talking about. When we talk about sales and marketing agents um, for the purposes of this presentation, we're talking about third parties because a lot of our highest risks come from that third party area. Companies use third parties for their sales and marketing because there are sectoral or regional specificities or complexities which mean they need a, um, a guy on the ground or a girl on the ground in order to understand the situation. They use these people for bidding and negotiating access to different markets and they're very common in sectors like oil and gas, defense, construction, pharmaceuticals for example. In terms of the way that regulators and authorities look at this practice there is some clear consensus here from the main anti-bribery and corruption legal instruments that we work with that it's a high risk area. So laws like the FCPA in the US and the UK Bribery Act in the UK and the Loi Safandu in France are coming down quite hard on the idea of intermediary risk, third party risk. If we're employing third parties to go and win us a new contract, it might be fine, but it might also bring with it an anti-bribery and corruption risk, which we, need to, uh, which we need to consider. And regulation is becoming more strict on this, as with the French example, de la Safande, which calls for quite strict and rigorous identification of those risks related to intermediaries. In terms of our research and the research we've done on this, we uh, do our assessments according to a framework of best practices. And using this framework of best practices, we can tell a company how close or how far away they are from the best practice in that particular area. And we do this on the ground. We don't just um, interview people by a video conference like this. Usually we are traveling, traveling, as I said, to over 85 countries, meeting people, talking to people, reading documents, and sniffing around companies to see what systems they have in place to counter bribery risks according to this framework of best practice. And when we're doing that, we do so according to a grading system. So some of the data that I'm going to show you in this presentation is based on grades that we have given to companies for each of the areas of good practice that we look for. And I'm going to talk about what they are in a second. But suffice it to say on grading that our top two grades are no action required, improvement recommended. That would be an adequate procedure. Our bottom two grades, 
action required or significant action required, that would adequate uh, that would indicate an inadequate procedure. And now we can then we can use all that data, put all that data together, and produce charts like this one, which show over a hundred companies and how they compare with each other in terms of the percentage of adequate procedures, which is the green, and their percentage of inadequate procedures, which is the red. And sometimes we use this to show our clients on the basis of our assessments, here's how you guys compare with everybody else. And one of the key things I want you to get out of this webinar today is how you can improve compared to everybody else. In terms of the criteria that we use to assess companies in the area of sales and marketing, we look for several things. Okay, first of all, some strong standards in the area of anti-bribery and corruption controls for sales and marketing. So if we can build in anti-corruption standards into the everyday processes of sales and marketing, that's a good start. Secondly, we know that sales and marketing, as we talked about, is not just an internal process. It also relies on intermediaries, third parties, agents outside the business. And so we would look to see if the company is encouraging or even forcing its third parties to follow its anti-bribery and corruption procedures. One of the ways that we can do this as a, as, a, as a company, and one of the things we check for in the companies we work with, is basic things like clauses in the contracts. If you put a clause or in, uh, in the contract or in the terms and conditions of your sales agent, then they at least know what the standards are in the company. We would never say that it's the very best communication method for agents, but we would say it's a good start. And finally, on this slide, clear guidelines for bidding. So if we're using third parties to literally do our bidding in the sense of to bid for work on our behalf, making sure that they know what are the rules for that and what are the parameters in which they can do that as a representative of the company. Secondly, we look for strict processes and controls. So any kind of commercial sponsorship, if we are deciding that as part of our marketing, we want to sponsor a football team, you need to make sure that that's done in an open and transparent way and avoids any potential misuse of funds. Likewise, we look for no inducements in cash or in kind to influence sales. This is a very obvious one, but if your agent is giving away money in order to help him secure a deal, then that's something that we would try and prevent in the companies we assess. Thirdly on this slide, controls on setting prices and discounts. So if we're working with salespeople or marketing people, who have complete control over the prices that they sell our goods for or the discounts that they can uh, that they can apply then it's an indication that they don't have the proper financial controls in place to restrict the actions that that sales agent can take to win a new contract and finally on this slide we look for appropriate justifiable remuneration for these third-party sales agents we need to make sure that we pay them in an appropriate way and that means uh, several things, which we're going to talk about with Mohammed later, but one of which means we don't give them huge sales commissions to win a new contract. If we are employing our third parties to win a new business and saying, you won't get paid until you win this contract, we are massively incentivizing them to do the wrong thing and to win that contract by any means necessary. So we take all that criteria and we start to look at the data from our assessments and what companies are doing well and what they're doing badly. First of all, I'd like to point out that these charts show inadequate procedures. They show things going wrong. The dark colors show 2014 data and the light colors show 2019 data. So high percentages here are, are a bad thing. But if we see the percentages decreasing from 2014 to 2019, that's a good thing. And you can see that in the area of sales agents, our controls to, uh, in the area of using intermediaries, there have been massive, massive improvements over the past five years. A huge increase in the percentage of companies who have uh, policies in place for sales agents, a huge increase in the level of companies who have gifts and hospitality policies specifically for sales agents. And we're gonna talk a bit more with Mohammed about why that's so important. However, it also shows some slightly worrying trends. At the bottom, you can see that 
in terms of the data between 2000, 2014 and 2019, that actually showed a slight increase in, a, in inadequate procedures. And so things got worse. And we think this might be because the world is a much more interconnected place and people are bidding for a lot more work in a lot more places. And so it's become harder to control the bidding process. Likewise, on this slide, we can see that issue of pay to sales agents being justifiable has massively improved from 39% inadequate in 2014 to only 16% inadequate in 2019. However, everything else in terms of commercial sponsorship, discounts and credit rules that we talked about, or use of cash inducements, incentives for sales, those procedures have got worse. So the webinar we're having today is very timely because it seems like a lot of companies are going in the wrong direction. Now, just to wrap up, these are some examples of worst practices and best practices that we see in terms of anti bribery and corruption controls in sales and marketing. Worst practices, we've talked about this, no controls. If you don't have any controls in place on prices, discounts, sales incentives, then you don't have sufficient control over the spend of your third party sales agents. Secondly, any inducements in cash or in kind, in kind means things that are uh, not cash but also of high value. To influence sales would be a big no-no and we see companies doing this and they would score very badly in our assessments. Finally, worst practices, uncapped, which means unlimited, all or nothing sales commissions. So saying to somebody, you won't get paid until you've secured this contract, so do whatever it takes. Best practices, if we're seeing companies that are routinely requiring their sales agents to follow the same anti-bribery and corruption policies that they have, that would be a very good practice. Likewise, we're seeing more companies who are moving away from using sales agents as third parties because they want to build up their own in-house sales team. It's a very good practice because it reduces the risk. It means that you have more control because more of your own people are doing this work. And finally, making sure that the fees that we pay to sales agents are justifiable or a flat rate, so not commission-based, because the large commissions, as we're going to discuss, might incentivize people to win a contract at any cost, including at the cost of ethical behavior. So before we move on to our discussion with Mohammed, and I know it's going to be a good discussion today, these are the final things that we want to leave you with. Key considerations, think about that increasing pressure from regulators. This area of third party sales and marketing is becoming more closely scrutinized. Secondly, if we're using sales agents, let's make sure we have controls, controls over what they can offer in terms of prices, discounts, et cetera. Let's be aware of that success fee element because the greater the success fee, i.e. the commission on sales, the greater the risk. So let's consider also that we can't outsource these risks. Uh, it's much better for us to keep risks within the company because we can control them. We can't just ask somebody else to engage in risky behavior on our behalf. Secondly, build up that in-house capacity so we can do more of our sales and marketing functions internally. Thirdly, let's make sure that the pay that we give to sales agents is reasonable so they're not incentivized to uh, indulge in uh, corrupt behavior in order to uh, just make a living. And finally, let's set up meaningful controls in this area. Increasingly, and the data shows this, companies are doing less in this area. And I think that's because we've been through a time of financial turmoil. The world is more interconnected now. Companies want to bid for more work in more places. And that's a fantastic area of globalization, but it should not be at the cost of proper controls in the area of sales and marketing. So Mohammed, I've done a lot of talking there, and so I'm going to shut up for a bit now, but I want to hear a bit more before we go into our discussion, and I've got some interesting questions for you, um, about your perspective on this. Tell us a bit more about uh, Refinitiv and how you look at these issues. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Michael. First, just to uh, to give a very brief uh, overview of what is Refinitiv, because I have a lot of uh, customers and people who might not know the name of this company. Uh, Refinitiv is this, it has been spin out from Thomson Reuters. So the financial and the risk division, which is the compliance division of Thomson Reuters, has been, uh, how say, uh, create has been has been spin out and created a new division, a new company, completely entire new company called Refinitiv. 
uh, with uh, with with Blackstone as the main shareholder. And by the way, by end of the year, we will be probably a London Stock Exchange company. But I'm trying. In Refinitiv, we have very clear two divisions. We have the division that are related to the financial info, stock market, financial info, investor, uh, brokers, uh, in, in purely in in a dealing room uh, of uh, banks or uh, capital market company. And we have another division which called risk. But in reality, from a risk perspective, we are only focusing on uh, governance, risk and compliance, and especially anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist finance, and anti-bribery. So, and we have, uh, how we call it, we have a big data uh, research center, which is collecting, consolidating the sanctioned data the people, the bribery people, the sanctioned people in this data. So this is uh, this is the uh, repetitive side. Go ahead. And so in terms of questions for our session, then it strikes me that on that basis, you're going to have a lot of interesting things to say. Um, and I thought we could start with a bit of a uh, perspective on your various different experiences in different sectors. So when we define third parties in the presentation we just gave we're thinking about those people who are doing sales and marketing on our behalf um, and i'd be interested to hear more from you about what uh, how we define a third party organization and if this means the same thing for businesses in different sectors let's think about banking financial services insurance service companies etc let's get, hear some more from you about how we define third parties in those areas yes so People have tendency to focus on a company or a bank has to tendency to focus on their customer. So for them, they need to check their customer if they are part of a sanction or wrongdoing list, of bribery or corruption. Unfortunately, in an in, in organization like a bank or corporate, they don't only work with their internal staff. They work with a third party, with an external supply with an external service company so depending on the sector in the banking and financial sector most of the scrutiny are toward the customers sometimes the customer of the customer what i mean by that if i do in my banking a transaction and i sending i'm sending money to michael then the bank has to check not only what muhammad is doing if he's uh, if this customer is part of the sanction list for corruption, money laundering, or terrorist finance, but also Michael, because he's the beneficiary of this transfer, of this transaction. In the insurance sector, well, the policy holding, it is a customer, but the policy holder might have a benefit. Uh, the benefit, uh, how to say, is not the customer himself. He might uh, underwrite the policy for, uh, let's say, life uh, a life policy for somebody else, third party. Therefore, this third party to need, need to be checked. This is in the insurance. As soon as we go to corporate sector, let's talk about the big corporate sector or small corporate sector. What they do, they sell product and they get this product is delivered by a third party. Okay. Then there may be different intermediary in delivering to supplying those goods and therefore and sometimes themselves they are distributing this through distributor um, agent whatever so all those parties are called a third party which means if i am a pharmaceutical group then the pharmaceutical companies that are serving seeing me then i need to check them okay but also all the intermediary and if i am having a company a truck company or delivering to pharmacy where this company I need to check her. So it is the third party. So the third party is a very, uh, how to say, moving between bar uh, target uh, definition and target as soon as we move from sector to sector. But in the corporate, the third party mean distributor, uh, agent, affiliate, any third party that you are any any service company that you are doing business with might bring you a very high reputation risk if they are listed in a financial crime. Absolutely. And I think one of the key things that we um, we need to 
talk about in this session it, are those agents, those third party agents, especially where they're doing sales on our behalf, where they are sent to secure the deal and to get the deal no matter what. And I'd be interested to know, um, in your experience, when as a consultant I talk about you've got to make sure that your bribery and corruption policies also apply to your sales and marketing agents as third parties. Have you seen that that's very difficult for companies? Have you seen that, in your experience, companies find this very hard? And have you seen any trends over the years? Yes, uh, well, first thing, this is getting better and better. But I remember discussing with some clients and they, un they don't understand, for them, they cannot interfere on the subcontracting company. They cannot interfere in the distributor. And they say, this is an own company. They have their own policy. Excuse me, if you are using them, well, you are supposed to check if their value and their, at least their value and their practice are in line with your value. Otherwise, you are washing your hand by giving to a rogue distributor the fact that he can corrupt, he can bribe, and you are saying yourself, no, I'm not doing that. But in reality, you are because you are not aligning you the distributor with you so uh, i saw a large corporate international having a meeting with their distributor and their subcontractor and stating guys we have this clear abc policy which is anti-bribery anti-corruption anti-terrorist finance uh, regulation and policy if you want to continue working with us then you have to apply it to apply the same but this unfortunately is not always the case for smaller corporate and smaller organization I think that's absolutely right. And I think a lot of the companies that we deal with uh, in our anti-bribery and corruption work, will, they say the same thing. So they say things like, uh, you're here, Mr. Pollock, you're here to assess me. You're not here to assess my agents. And how can I be responsible for what they do? And our answer is always the same. Our answer is that, number one, you can't outsource your risk, right? We keep coming back to this issue of if you want to do something high risk, you can't just pay somebody else to do that for you and assume it's going to be okay. And number two, a lot of the uh, legal instruments that we look at in terms of bribery and corruption extend liability from the, uh, the core company to the third parties that it uses. So a lot of the big bribery and corruption scandals that we've seen and payments of uh, fines that we've seen have been because companies have been using local sales and marketing people to get a deal who have paid bribes and that company itself has paid the price ultimately. So we would say exactly what you're saying that you can't outsource this risk and if your third parties are doing something you can be equally liable for that kind of action if they're doing it on your behalf. You, you, you simply cannot transfer the reputation of risk. You exactly. simply cannot transfer the reputation of risk. If this company are going to be indicted you will be the first one in the court. Exactly. And I'm, I'm reminded of, um, I'm reminded of the, the slide that uh, we used to talk about Refinitiv and all these different areas of risk that, that you look at here. And it strikes me that you must be helping companies to assess their own third parties for, for risk in a, to a certain extent. Um, and the, the way we approach it and the way you approach it are quite complementary. Yeah, we are providing the list and the database of bad guys, bad company, don't do business with. Very, very, very. So whatever you have a name and there is a business partnership or a contract to be signed with the third party or customer, you have to check if this customer or third party is not listed in the bad guys. Very, very. So because those names are coming from international body list, uh, governmental list, um, a law enforcement list, you cannot ignore them. If the Interpol is putting somebody like Mohammed Dawood in the list, well, you better not do business with Mohammed Dawood. Otherwise, you cannot say, I ignore it. It's not possible. This legislation, and by the way, this legislation are national because remember, the big uh, players, the big international body like the FATF, are obliging the different country to integrate those legislation in their own legislation. And they are doing a review and um, doing a sanction when the country is not applying that. So 
all the countries in the Middle East, uh, I can talk about Africa, they are all having a very strong legislation on the third party risk. The question is, do you understand it or do you, do you don't understand? And the second question is, is it effective or you are just ticking a box? Which means that you are thinking, you are having a policy, but this policy in the reality is not applicable. It's not deployed. Yeah. And I think exactly, we, we often come in at that moment. We come in and work with companies where, yeah, they, they've got a policy, but they need to know how to make it work. Or yeah, they've got a policy, but we need to know on behalf of their client whether or not that policy is actually implemented or not. And we do a lot of interesting work in that area. I'm seeing um, some companies, uh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing some questions come through here from the audience. Um, these are really good uh, questions, so keep them coming. Um, your questions for, for me and Mohammed, and I'm going to store them up, and we're gonna look at them in the final 15 minutes. But um, Mohammed, I'm going to impose a bit more on your time here with some more questions, um, because I'd really like to move away from um, the risk area to the uh, mitigation area. So we've talked a lot so far about the fact that sales and marketing agents, especially third parties, can be very high risk. And we've talked about ways of identifying those risks. But let's talk about once we've identified a risk, what tools do we have to mitigate that risk? If we want to, if we want to carry on working with someone, but we know that there is a risk there, how can we make sure that they're following our, our processes? I mean, we think about things like training, and everybody assumes that if you give somebody some training or email them some e-learning, that's all you need to do. But what other tools do we have to reduce that third party risk? I mean, how do we make sure that they're declaring their gifts and hospitality or declaring their conflicts of interest? So the first thing you need to check whether this training or the communication you have done, which is the disclosure, has been integrated and understood. And for that, you are not going to do only training, you have to do what we call quiz and certification, which means that you can very well through your, your training, uh, e-learning uh, technology, uh, provide some questionnaire quiz, and you are obliging your distributor or your agent to, to respond. And based on the response, you understand if these people understand the point or not, or they got it. Because sometimes training, you are training people and they are doing something else, or their mind is uh, busy on something else. This is the first thing. The second thing, you need to have, you, you don't do only training. You have to, very, to have a very clear policy that defines very clearly the practices about what are you talking about. Uh, you know, if you say uh, you should not receive a gift or, a, or you should not re receive a gift or you cannot, you cannot give a gift because there will be conflict and, and it might be perceived as a bribery. It's not enough because if you are in Kuwait, well, hundred dollars maybe are considered to be a tips compared to a hundred dollars in Kenya or in uh, in Yemen. So automatically you have to readjust what are you talking based on your uh, standard of living and you, your environment. You have absolutely to 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 do that. Uh, the uh, so the the what I'm saying is sometimes. Uh, I noticed that in many, many uh, policies, they, some countries are, some people, some organizations are shy, or they think it's politically not correct to talk about gift or to talk about bribery. And therefore, because they assume that this is not a very, it's a taboo uh, concept to talk about it, they leave it to the agent to decide how they can handle it. And therefore, you will have sometimes error or sometimes wrongdoing. Absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right that when it comes to things like gifts and hospitality, but also conflicts of interest, there are so many different definitions in so many different countries. So, you know, a lot of the work we do is very international. And as you say, a $100 limit on uh, gifts and hospitality might be totally appropriate if you're in Canada, but if you're in, uh, you know, Congo, then it's totally inappropriate and because $100 can get you a long way. Um, and the way we would think about this question about the kind of mitigation procedures that we can put in place with our third parties would be, 
first of all, the contractual side that we talked about at the beginning, if you're employ effectively employing them to work for you for a while, put it in their contract that they have to abide by your anti-bribery and corruption policies. Secondly, once you've told them that legally they have to abide by your policies, you need to treat them as an extension of your workforce. If they're doing work on your behalf, make sure that you communicate your policy to them in the same way you would an employee. Make sure that you communicate your gifts and hospitality thresholds to them in the same way you would an employee and make sure that you are checking up on them the same way that you would an employee. Because all of, that, all of those actions would reduce your risk. And I think those are things over and above training, because uh, training can be quite uh, one way. A lot of people assume that once you've done training, you're, you're set. But I agree with you that there's a lot more you can do. The training and control. If you don't control, then the training is uh, totally useless. Um, yeah. I can give you an example of uh, control. If I take you four times for a dinner, depending on the level of the amount paid, I will immediately receive a notification from my compliance manager asking me why you took Michael to four times the same dinner because he's not the only customer. So I will have to justify to my compliance why I took uh, Michael because we were doing a, a project and during this project we were working intensively and maybe I have to justify otherwise why I am treating Michael different from the other customers because I'm only taking Michael and not the other customers. The same thing, you need to have some control which means that you need to, to send the questionnaire to your intermediary and to your distributor and to the third party. And this questionnaire can be a QIC questionnaire, a very interesting questionnaire saying, are you applying this principle? And based on that, you know whether they apply it or not. At least you are making them liable by, I ask you the question and you didn't respond or your response was not exactly in the same uh, way or expected response I was expecting. So therefore, I'm sorry, you cannot be my distributor or you cannot be my agent. Yeah. And I think, you know, while we're on the topic of uh, gifts and hospitality in, in sales and marketing, I think a lot of the time people assume that the biggest problems are in countries, you know, like, uh, you know, we talked about Kuwait, or people assume the biggest co uh, problems are in Gulf countries or North African countries or African countries or Eastern European countries. But I must say that some of the worst examples of excessive gifts and hospitality uh, in, the, in the area of sales and marketing was in America. You know, it was in an extremely Western environment. Um, and so this is not a, a phenomenon, this is not a problem that's localized to a few countries that in a very lazy way we say, oh, well, that's an issue in that country. That's a cultural thing. This is something that happens everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And also uh, the perception sometimes is if, uh, as, as a... Uh, the corrupting the corrupting party is not very very important role it is the uh, corrupted party that should not accept well i'm sorry if it both are in the same way so uh, and distinguish between the guy who receive a bribery and the guy who's offering the bribery then it is a big mistake because as i said it has to apply if there is uh, somebody accepting there is somebody offering and this guy is liable as the other guy Absolutely. It's, it's a two-way thing. And I think a lot of the best practice guidance that we've seen and a lot of the laws that we've seen agree that, you know, this is always a two-way thing with two people responsible. It's a pact, right? It's an agreement at the end of the day. And you need two people for an agreement. You need two sides. And just before we move on to um, the questions coming in from the audience, by the way, guys, keep sending in your questions because there's some great questions coming through here and we're going to make time for those in about five minutes. So do keep asking your questions. The more controversial your question, the better, as far as we're concerned. Um, but just to round up some of this discussion, uh, Mohammed, I want to know about, let's talk about those sectors where sales and marketing are very, very difficult to control. Um, so let's talk more about the, your experience in various sectors and any examples that you've seen of companies where, gosh, this is just really hard for them, and maybe it's too difficult, and every day they think, we can't do anything about this because it's too hard for us to control our sales and marketing activities. Well, listen, uh, I frankly, it's happening in different sectors. Some sectors are very highly regulated. You are talking about banking. 
because there is a lot of control. But uh, frankly, I already met a lot of business uh, men who were saying, without the bribery, he cannot do business. And therefore, he's himself. So he's complaining about the bribery. He's complaining about the other party asking for bribery. But in the same time, he's, he's himself, uh, how say, injecting and part of the cycle to do the bribery. So uh, it's, it's um, it, how say, the, the issue that we are having is depending on the, on, the, uh, on the different sector, because if the sector is very highly regulated and you cannot do transaction without auditing, I give you an example, in some real estate, uh, in some country, you cannot do real estate without banking transaction. So there is a trace, there is an audit log and everything. In some other countries, they allow cash. So therefore, if the company want to respect themselves, they should not allow transaction cash. You you were talking about uh, uh, reward your people and everything. Anything that is related to cash is a very, uh, how say, it is a very considered to be very high risk sector. So therefore, with all the, the financial system that we are having, it's obvious that doing a transaction through a legal mean and the, through banking mean and doing a transaction without this mean that you are you are not being transparent. You are trying to hide something. Okay, is the um, the um, uh, what rea what we are realizing is more the sector more the sector is on the corporate space in the SMEs. Okay, more they have the impression that they have to accept the rules, which is absolutely not true. Uh, not true. And in fact, I can tell you a story about my own experience. I have been, as a private company provider, I have been in uh, one of the bank, I remember, one of the emerging countries, I would not say which one, okay? And I was surprised because we are considered to be top, uh, very high-end company, maybe expensive, maybe, and the guy has a choice to select, I would say, other uh, cheaper company. And I told him, but uh, you know, we are not very, very cheap. And he said, I select you because in your contract, in your proposal, there is a section about anti-bribery and anti-corruption. And it is stating clearly that if this contract is proved to be under corruption, the contract will be void even in the future with automatically legal action. So, he told me, I just want to have my my peers to understand that if I am selecting you, it's because you are very tough in your uh, anti-bribery and anti-corruption, and you didn't pay me to, to do the deal. I say, is that? Yes, because in this uh, area or in this corporation, in this country, the perception was we do a lot of deal through corruption. So he won. So in fact, it is uh, it is almost a, a market appeal. It's a branding. The you can very well in your proposal and your contract include a statement stating that if this contract is done through bribery, then the contract is void and there is a legal action. And you know what? Well, it's either the counterparty will accept it and they say, great. This means that it's proved that I am not doing this contract by paying. Or they want they will avoid it, and this means that they have something in mind, which means that can we find an arrangement? So you you were to, we were talking just before about a type of tools. I think this is a very good tool, and you can you know take uh, uh, I don't know how many uh, organization contract and read it and just try to find a section a paragraph about anti corruption and anti bribery. I think that's an excellent point, Mohammed, because what you've done there is you've looked at the positive side of what we're talking about. And we've talked a lot in this session so far about the fact that sales and marketing, if it's not compliant, can bring huge risks. OK, what, what you're talking about, and it's an excellent uh, perspective, is that if you get your compliance right, so if you if you are a compliant company in terms of anti-bribery and corruption, that can be a sales and marketing tool in itself. You can use that to show people, oh, we're a company that does things properly. We are an ethical company. And 
it's the other side of the coin, isn't it? We can actually use this to uh, win new clients. We can use compliance to win new clients the same way some companies use bribery to win new clients. Uh, 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 frankly, if you apply the rules and you are transparent and you are applying a principle, the customer respects you more and they will tend to do business with you than the other party because they are not sure how the other party then will be acting whether in the post services or the way they will treat the customer after uh, fact, whatever. So it's very, very important that your credibility is also on this side to convince the customer that I can give you a very simple example. Uh, you go to a country and then you sell to this customer for the same good, the same product. This one you sell him uh, $100 and the other one you sell him $1,000. You cannot do that. You have to respect your client because otherwise, if you start jangling with the pricing, this means that you 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 are talking about commission. This means that it's not logic. How come that you can sell to a customer uh, something for hundred dollar that you are selling to somebody else for one thousand dollars? You might justify this if geographically you are saying in the U.S. and in uh, I don't know in Middle East, but in within the same region with the same thing, this is so the same thing. We have a lot of customers saying. We need to negotiate your price and you have to tell them, yes, we can, but with this framework, because we respect our customer existing and the new one, and we don't play with the pricing and we don't play with the quantity or the goods and everything. So there are a lot of means, there are a lot of ways to position your transparency and your uh, ethical, okay, we are talking about ethical business here. So the ethical part of it, has to be always not only uh, written in a, in a very vague document, it has to be shown in the way you are doing your day-to-day -day business, sales and everything. Absolutely. And um, I'm going to move on to some of these questions coming in from the audience now because uh, you guys have been kind enough to send us your questions. Keep sending them. We're going to address them as many as we can right now. Um, one question's come in from an audience member talking about standards, right? And we talk about the ISO standards, we talk about the standards I talked about, the Good Corporation Anti-Bribery and Corruption Framework. And this question is about when we look at those standards of uh, fraud and corrupt practices uh, and the checks that we can use to, uh, to, to assess people, what about large organizations, very large organizations, and are there any uh, areas where these kind of checks, like the ISO standards or our framework, don't uh, don't address don't address certain aspects of a large company. And I think I can answer that first, if I may, by saying that the the tool that we use uh, is very similar to the ISO standards, but it's uh, designed for big companies, right? I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of the companies we work with are large European multinationals. Um, and there are large European multinationals that are doing business in parts of the world where it's very difficult to do business ethically because corruption is very ingrained into the economic system, for example, these fragile economies. And so the way we assess these companies is we take a large company, like, um, you know, let's say a multinational with offices all over the world, and instead of saying, we're going we're gonna to take a view about your whole company, we would go to their offices and their businesses in different parts of the world and take a view on how the, the policies of that company are being implemented in each location. And the more that you do that, and we've done that for several large companies, the more you can build up a picture of the whole business. And you can feed, back, feed that back to the, um, to the CA, to the, uh, to the sort of mother company, and say, you have these standards, but you're doing business in country A, country B, country C. The problem with it is that these standards are very difficult in country A because of this. They're slightly more difficult in country B because of that. But in country C, you're okay. So countries A and B can learn from country C. So we divide it up like that. And we often do a lot of site visits to break down these big companies into smaller, more easily accessible chunks. Do you have any views on that, Mohammed? before we move on to the next question? Listen, um, the big organization their reputation is a, is a milestone and most of them they have very strong policy and uh, people need to understand that they might have no system people very often they ask me how do you do technology for conflict of interest or this type 
and there is a technology there are systems it's like uh, workflow systems like uh, uh, it's very similar to uh, risk oper operation risk you have to log all the events that happen during the day which means that the gift that you have a conflict of interest you have and everything and the system consolidate all this information and track uh, i was just talking about uh, uh, expense expense system that we have in Refinitiv, where the system will check if i went to dinner with mike uh, several times where my policy is saying for any third party any customer i can only have two or three dinners over this time of period with this amount the same thing there is a process and procedure in many companies where they have to declare any gift about certain amount to the compliance. So I, it's it's natural that we receive a gift. I might receive a gift from you, uh, Michael, but then I have to. I have a policy saying when I receive a gift, I have to go to my compliance and say I receive this gift from um, uh, Michael. Can I keep it? Can I do what? And there is a procedure. So. Uh, there are a lot of tools that uh, the uh, large company are doing and by the way more and more large company are not only uh, doing their uh, very have a very strong and they updated uh, with the help like a company like you uh, their framework and their policy not only they do that but they do it almost on a yearly base it's a yearly base ha harassing and hammering the same message okay it's very important for them the uh, so the, the because and the, when you talk to a local uh, corporate they say yeah yeah because they have an, an international exposure it has nothing to do whether you have an international exposure or a national exposure if you want to apply your ethic you apply it okay and what is funny is sometimes the people apply ethic in their own personal life but they don't apply it in the business which is funny which is very funny so um but we are seeing listen we are seeing a lot of improvement and uh, we are seeing a lot of improvement because the people have tendency to think they have to do this by own their own their, themselves but with their own resources and more and more they realize that there are specialized company and advisory company that help them to understand where to start or where to finish or Absolutely how to reshuffle their existing business conduct to integrate those new concepts like uh, like the concept of bribery the concept of gift what does mean conflict of interest and so on absolutely and i think uh, this question that's just come through here from the audience is absolutely perfect uh, for you mohammed because it deals with use of technology in compliance and the question says when we talk about digitalization of companies, has this brought with it a new level of transparency? And does this mean things are going to get more rigorous? And I would answer that from the corporation's point of view, and you, you may have different view, Mohammed, that technology and technological solutions for checking your agents, third parties, etc., are fantastic, but they only get you so far. And so there'll always be space when you have that gray area where you want to work with somebody but you're not quite sure about them on the basis of the technology that you use to assess them where you need to go and send somebody to go and look at them to go and look at them shake hands with them talk to them read their documents go through the filing cabinet and see what kind of a company they are and what kind of systems they have in place so my answer to this question would be technology is an incredible tool but we need other things as well we need to go further sometimes what, what do you think Mohammed? Technology is a very good tool to help you to track and to monitor, okay? But like you say, what are we talking about? We are talking about business relationship and the word relationship mean everything here, okay? This is the first thing. The second thing, in some side of the world is very difficult. Techno I give you an example. I was talking to you about this big database that we have for people don't do business with but believe me there is a name called Mohammed Dawood who is listed in this database in bribery and corruption one is smuggler one is terrorist one so therefore if I have a company called I don't know as a distributor and you are decide you are leaving the system to decide 
whether I am a good guy or a bad guy, then he will reject me based on only those. While if you come to see me, then you understand that it's not me who is in this list, that there is similarity of names. I am having this principle, and by talking to me, you understand my value. Remember, we are talking about human value, and human value cannot be benchmarked by technology. I agree with that. And I think uh, in terms of that, the transparency point that this person makes in, the, in their question, I think it's absolutely right that, you know, in, on a certain level, technology gives us more transparency because we're doing everything now uh, by computer. And that's become more true because of coronavirus. Every training session I've done in the past few weeks, every interview I've done, every communication I've had has been over computer. So somewhere there's a record of that, right? which means that if I ever get into um, trouble with the authority, somebody can see everything I've done and everything I've said and everything I've asked for over the last few weeks. And I think the, to the extent that we keep using technology more as a kind of hack during coronavirus, especially, the more transparency there will be if you get into trouble. So I think it's, that person raises a really good point. Um, you know, and, it's, sorry, it's go ahead, true. sorry, it's true because we have a lot of technology that can compare a contract versus invoices. But this is, as I say, for tracking and monitoring. Okay, so you are doing a co big contract, uh, trade finance or whatever, export import, and you are starting paying. And there are systems that are very smart that compare what was the contract, what was the good order, what was the uh, cost of unit, and check whether the invoicing that is going parallel are reconciled. And those technology exist today. But as I say, doesn't replace the ethical part of it. It's only helped to track and monitor wrongdoing, and especially now that we are getting through uh, very uh, digitalization. So by coming back to the digitalization, if you can take a contract, import, export contract, digitalize it, make it as a readable data, and then it, it tra track it, put some rules in this data and have the system checking who's been paid, who are we paying the guy that we signed the contract with? Are we having any third payment going somewhere? Are all those can be seen uh, checked by a system, but the system cannot do everything. If you have to select a rogue, okay, let me just tell you. If you have to select a, a, a rogue a corrupted entity, don't expect the system to track for it because you selected you so your due diligence uh, i i come back to your previous uh, <laughs> webinar your due diligence has not been done correctly so i'm sorry it's not only applying the rules you apply the rules and you check that your due diligence and all the process that are around are in accordingly i totally agree with that i mean we've had more questions from the audience here but i don't think we're going to have time for all of them one of them just talked about what kind of uh, compliance program should we be using to deal with these things? And I think a point that I can make in conclusion to the session is that Mohammed and I, we're not here to sell you compliance programs. We're not here to sell you solutions. In fact, what I hope you, you're gaining from this session is the, is the sense that it's, there's no one solution, okay? There's no compliance program that I can email to you and that will solve all of your problems. It's about context. It's about complexity. It's about where you are, who you're dealing with, what sector you're in, um, et cetera. And so the best thing you can do is to take account of that complexity and see where your risks are and implement mitigation measures according to the risks that you face. Um, and tools like uh, the tools that Refinitiv talk about and assessments like the assessments I talk about um, will help you do that, but we're not here to sell you anything. Mohammed talked about the previous session uh, that we did on due diligence, which was quite a few weeks ago now. But uh, to wrap up, I should point out that we are doing this as a, in, in a series. So we've just finished sales and marketing, but we're moving on next week to the human resources function. So we're gonna be talking a lot more about conflicts of interest, gifts and hospitality, et cetera, everything that you might think about if you were a head of human resources. So do put your human resources uh, department in touch with us. We hope to see all of you at that session next week. Um, other than that, I think it just remains for me to, to thank you again, Mohammed, for your fantastic contributions today. We've had a really good hour there. I think we've given people a lot of stuff to think about 
a lot of content. We'll be sending around the slides to people as a follow-up. It's got more information about Refinitiv, more information about Good Corporation. But thanks very much, Mohammed, for participating, and, and I hope you can do another one of these again. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, with the pleasure. I am passionate about this subject. Fantastic. Okay, so thanks also to everybody for joining uh, at home. Do join us for the next session and take good care until then. Thanks, Michael. Huh? Thanks, Michael.